So where we left off uh, is we, by the way, this is Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Matthew's, if you haven't met him, Matthew's a third year grad. He's going to TA this with me. So feel free to reach out to him for help uh, on the homework if you need it. Um, and he'll be here most of the time. Uh, OK, so we got through the EQ section last time, right? Any questions from any of that stuff we talked about last time as you like went back and thought about it? Um, anything that you're like, oh, I didn't quite understand that, or revisit anything, or? Can we revisit EQ so that we can progress from there? Uh-huh, totally that. So, um, th this EQ, EQ is called, e stands for equalization. Yeah. And uh, the idea behind equalization is it's it's really frequency manipulating frequencies. So um, you know here's like here's the guitar. And if I put the EQ in, I have four bands here. The first one is called HF, which stands for high frequency, and it is what it's called a high shell. So it can boost or reduce some swath of high frequencies, okay? You don't get to decide what that range of high frequencies are, at least not on this console. Some consoles you can. The fourth one is called LF for low frequency, and it's a low shell, so it will boost or reduce some swath of low frequencies, okay? So, higher low frequencies, less low frequencies. Okay. Question? Well, doing the sound gym games. Yeah. Um, when I was like trying to figure out, you know, how to get the, the bass to lower so I could just hear yeah. like the higher frequency. I guess, I don't know if they have like a feature like that on there. No. But you just In fact, you have to keep moving it to the right place. Yes. Yeah. Do not EQ your system okay. in, for sound gym. Okay. Right. Because the whole point is to learn how to identify the frequency spectrum as it's presented to you, okay. right? If now, if you're whatever you're listening on, like don't do it on your like built-in computer speakers, <laughs> you know, at the very least use headphones. Um, if you have some interesting monitors like that, that's even better, but, but at the very least headphones, even, even cheap AirPods or something like that would be better than the computer speakers. I would right. maybe get, if you can afford it, it's a little bit nicer headphones than that, but, um, but anyway, that's that's the way to do it. Okay, and then these two middle ones are called semi-parametric, and so you got a high mid and a low mid, and they have a fixed bandwidth, which is probably like I don't know, octave and a half or something worth of frequencies, and you get to decide where the center of that is. Okay, so you can move that 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 range of frequencies somewhere to where you want it, and then you can boost or reduce it. So. For example, I can say, all right, I'm going to go to 3 kilohertz, and I can boost or reduce some swath of frequencies centered on 3 kilohertz. And you can look up in the manual to find out just how big that chunk is. And then low mid does the same thing, so I can take us to around 500 hertz, and there's boosting 500 hertz. Reducing 500 hertz. Now, what was the rule of thumb that I taught you last week about boosting and reducing? So Just reduce. Yep. He said, like, "Don't boost, right? Because boosting causes clipping. <laughs> if you've done everything right up here, and you start boosting frequencies, you will clip and you'll have distortion. So don't do it. Um, and most of the most of the ear training is sound gym focuses on frequency training. Focuses on helping you to hear when you hear something that is louder, okay? There's the one game called Kit Cut where you do listen to cuts in a frequency spectrum, but, but uh, that's not quite as useful as the Peak Master, which helps you to identify when something is too loud because that's, what, that's the skill you really want because you, when you think about EQing, you don't want to be saying, oh, what do I want more of? You want to be asking yourself, what do I have too much of? Um, and that's the, the mindset you want to get yourself in. Okay. Um, and this console, like most 
good consoles will give you the ability to bypass the equalizer if you would like to, because every electronic circuit makes a little bit of noise. And whether you're using it or not, just purely running the sound through it does add noise. So if you don't have to use it, don't use it. You can hit that little bypass button and it just goes around it, which is super useful. Okay, that's a real crash course in EQ. We'll play around with EQ more in some of the other consoles and you'll get more experience using it, but that's kind of the, the rough basics. Any other any questions about that? Okay, good. All right, next thing we run into is the aux section. So, uh, and this console has six auxes. Um, auxes represent places that sound can go. Okay, so you can take some of the sound and you can send it to that place. So if you look on the back of the console here, there are outputs for the auxes. Uh, so little physical connections, you can plug a cable into that and get sound out of that aux. So the aux is just a little place in the console that collects sound. And then you can listen to that if you want to. Um, and you get a knob on the input channel for an aux. And then what the knob does is it allows you to decide how much of the sound on this channel you want to send into that aux. So here I've just turned up aux one knob on input one, and I can decide how much of that kick drum I want to put into that aux. Okay? And so this whole row of knobs here are the aux ones. So I can decide how much of each of these channels I want to put into the aux. which is the aux one master knob, okay? So this is the knob that, uh, that, that takes all of the sound that got mixed here, and it goes there, and then you can decide how loud, just like this is kind of like this main fader, right? So how loud is the signal that comes out of that aux, okay? Now, what do you use these for? Um, I, I hope so, yes. I mean, you, 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 would, you would probably use some oxes in a musical if you're doing things right. Um, you, what's, what's that? To your monitor. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, monitors are, are a pretty classic use of, of oxes. Um, there, you can also use oxes to send the sound into other devices that you want to, like I've got some things in the rack here, some processing devices that will alter the sound in some way. So you can use Oxus to collect some of that sound, send it into that processor, have the processor do something to it, and then bring it back into the console, and now you've got something different, okay? Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, generally speaking, the, the rule of thumb for Oxus that I want you to remember is Oxus generally are used for things the audience doesn't hear. So if you need to send sound to something that, something or someone who is not the audience, you use an aux, okay? Um, so if you need to send it to a monitor on the stage for a performer, or you need to send it to a dressing room backstage, or you need to send it to a reverb processor, or something like, you know, that's what auxes are for, okay? It's to send the sound to not audience, okay? Um, and you get two sorts of auxes, okay? You have what's called pre-fade auxes and post-fade auxes. So this one that I've been playing with right now is a pre-fade aux. And the way I know that is the faders are down and I'm still getting sound, <laughs> okay? And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what I do here. You know, I can, this would be my audience this way. I'm mixing for the show, and th if this is a monitor for a musician, me looping here doesn't change the which they get very squirrely when you start like changing their mix and they'll start shouting. Okay, so 
or they give you evil looks, you know. Okay. Stop it. Uh, so, prefade just means sound goes into the aux before the fader. Before it goes through the fader. It means the fader is not affecting. Now, there is another option, uh, which is post fade. So let me show you a post fade aux, if I may. So I'm going to go into aux three, and aux three has a little button here that lets you toggle these two, three and four, you can toggle between pre-fade or post-fade behavior. And interestingly enough, you can do it per channel, which is kind of cool. Some consoles, it's like a global thing. Like you can say, Aux 3 is pre-fade or post-fade on a global across the, the console thing. But this one, you can do it per channel. So on some channels, Aux 3 and 4 could be pre-fade. On some channels, they could be post-fade. I have no idea why would you would ever want that. Um, I'm, I'm really struggling to think of that, what that scenario is. But somebody must have asked for it. Because um, what they're trying to do is they gave you six auxes. And you usually need some combination of pre or post. Um, but you know, it costs money every ox you add. And so try, in an effort to control the cost, like, well, we'll give them six auxes. We'll fix two of them as pre-fade, two of them as post-fade. And then we'll make two of them switchable. That way, you can kind of create the combination of pre and post fade auxes that you want. Okay. Um, so right now I've got all the pre buttons unpressed, which means this should be a post fade aux. So um, let me also plug in my aux three. Okay, good, I did. Okay. So uh, I'm turning this up. I've got the I've got the main one up, right? I've got it cranked right now, and I'm not hearing any sound. Why? Because the fader's down. Okay. Because it's post fade. I bring the fader up again. Okay. So now I can create my mix of sounds. And I have to bring the fader up over to here. Why would you ever want that? Well, I can think of a few reasons. <laughs> um, sometimes, uh, like let's say that um, we're doing uh, like a musical theater show and everyone's wearing a mic and you're sitting there and if you're doing your job right, which we'll learn about this later in the semester, you're, you're not just gonna, when people walk on the stage, you're not just gonna bring that mic up, right? Just because they're standing out there, right. okay? That's a really good way to create a lot of feedback <laughs> and a lot of comb filtering. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna follow the script and you're gonna be like, okay, unless there are words coming out of that person's mouth, their fader is not gonna be up. So it's gonna be, you know, first character speaks, says something, second character speaks, third character speaks, fourth character speaks, second character comes back in, third character, first character. You're going to be doing that, right? And this is so the audience only hears through the sound system the people who are saying things or singing things, okay? We'll talk more about that later. But I guarantee you what will also happen is you will have um, like musicians and stage managers and stuff like that that are also going to want to hear those mics. And th just like the audience doesn't want to hear all the mics on at one time, neither does the stage manager, and neither does the music director. Right? Like they don't want to hear all the people gossiping off stage, which is what you would have if you did if you did a pre-fade off for all those vocal mics, right? Mm -hmm. So you want them to hear something that reflects what you're doing with the vocal mix, right? So when you bring a fader up uh, for a vocal mic, they hear it in the monitor, and when you take it down, they don't hear it anymore. Okay. So you do that through a post-fade aux, 
and you, you do it through an aux because then you can adjust the mix a little bit because what, you know, the, the kind of balance that sounds good out in the house, that same balance may not sound right on a monitor that's sticking right in front of your head or headphones or something. That one voice, because maybe you've got somebody who's got a really strong voice. And so they're cutting through the air really effectively and therefore you're not mixing them as hot in the system as you are other people. Uh, but you don't want that voice to be quieter in a monitor just because you've mixed the fader lower. And so you can boost that one on the aux so that it comes through that aux a little bit hotter than, than it does in the main system. And that way you still have, um, they still only hear it if you put the fader up, but the mix that is heard in the monitor is a slightly altered mix than what you're actually delivering to the house. And that's where a post fade aux can come in really handy. There's another scenario where post fade aux can come in handy, and that's what we have set up right now. So here's, uh, here's the mic. Um, we've got a, we have a reverb processor here. Okay, so this is, this adds reverberation. Reverberation is this thing that makes you sound really good when you sing in the shower. <laughs> okay, it's reverb is the sound of reflections. So, um, okay. There we go. All right, so here's the mic, right? Great. Sounds awesome, kind of. Um, this room has some natural reverberation, okay? There's a lot of cinder block paint and concrete that all reflects sound really well. So there's some reverberation naturally in this room. You really hear it on the recordings, the class recordings, you hear the reverberation a lot in here. Um, but maybe this isn't enough. You know, maybe it's like, yeah, I want more. Uh, so I have currently, it's Ox 5, Matthew? Uh, let's see, it's Ox the cable. Okay. I think you just did to get the post paid. No, I did that for Ox 3. For the, I did that for the monitor. Oh. So yes, that should be fine. Okay. Oh yes, the reverb is Ox 5. So Ox 5 feeds, go, you know, comes out of that Ox 5 output and goes into this lexicon reverb processor. Okay. So I'm just saying, take some of the sound, put it into that reverb processor. So that reverb processor adds this artificial sound of reflections and then spits it back out. And then we have brought it back in. We've taken that signal out of the reverb processor and we have patched it into an input on the console. So now we have a new sound that we get to add to our mix. It's the reverb sound, okay? So let's see how that works. Um, so I'm going to just turn up this mic. Now look at the input meter on the, on the reverb processor. See how I'm seeing input coming in now? Yes. So, Crank this up. We've got sound coming in, and now it's coming back. See, I've got signal on this channel here. So if I bring this up now, this is routed into my main system here. Now, when I talk, I have extra reflection. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is really helpful uh, because it covers up a lot of mistakes and makes everything sound a little bit nicer. Um, and yeah. So, any questions about that? How that works? Uh, yes. Uh, with the pre-fader boxes, if you mute it, does that turn it off? Ah, well, that's an interesting question. The answer is it depends. Okay. Um, maybe. Maybe not. Is that my console dependent? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, talk, to try I'll talk a bit more about that in just a second, but yes, the answer is it depends. You will find that most answers to questions I'll ask you in class can be answered with either comb filtering <laughs> or it depends. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, two, the two best answers. Yep. Most most questions I'll ask you can be answered in one of those two ways. That GEQ is not the answer. Yeah. Well, hopefully we only have to talk about that once. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So. Great, we did that with a post-fade aux. Now, why a post-fade aux, not a pre-fade aux? Well, because, let's say I'm talking and speaking into my mic, and I am done now, and I end my song, and so I end my song, and so I'm talking, and I take the fader out. I would really like that reverb to go away, too. <laughs> okay? If, but if I was using a pre-fade aux, 
sent to that reverb, then the reverb would <laughs> still be there. Like it would still be going out into the process or still be coming back in and I would still have a reverb even though I take that out. The only way to get out the reverb too would be able to take both faders out. And that's kind of a bummer because when you do that, then it cuts off the reverb. So listen to what happens if I cut this out really quick. And I'm done with my songs. Ring out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. As opposed to, and I'm done with my song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So if you do it as a pre-fade aux, then that reverb tail gets cut off when you duck fade. Okay? And you do this with an aux because different sounds will want different amounts of reverb to make them sound good. And so you want to be able to use the little knobs to decide this one I want more reverb on, this one I want less reverb on, so on and so forth. Okay? Questions? No. You're doing great explaining. Okay. And that, so in this case, it's aux five, right? Yep. It's going to the lexicon, and then it's coming out of the lexicon stereo into yep. stereo one. Right. Yeah. So part of part of what happens with the reverb processor is the reverb processor is taking you know a, a single channel mix of everything that is on that aux, right? And it is creating reflections, and it creates two sets of reflections so, um, that could be called stereo. Um, but that that term doesn't usually have a whole lot of meaning in theater because you know only five people get to sit in a place where you really get to your stereo. So so generally speaking, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to trying to make stereo work in theater. I like to think about it more like I get two different versions of sound bouncing around inside of my virtual room. Okay, and so. You know, I have to then put that out of loudspeakers where the audience hears, and where I want them to hear those two different versions of sound bouncing. Sometimes I'll put, you know, one version out over here and the other version out over here, or you know, just to give a different, you know, a sense that this is coming from a room around me, right? So you get two different versions. Uh, I'm currently feeding that into a single input channel that is allowed to take two inputs. It's called a stereo input. So it is labeled like left in, right in on a single channel. I have one fader that does that. Um, but I can ultimately decide where that goes out to. Sure. Right? Okay. Um, so could you put it back into a regular channel? Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would probably put it into two mono channels. You know, because I do get two signals out of the reverb. So I could, I could just do two extra channels that I'm not using. But I just happen to have this one that will take two channels at once. And I'm, I'm lumping these things together because they're connected, um, even though I might route them differently from the output point. Yep. Okay. All right. There's there's oxes. Okay. General remember rule of thumb rules of thumb about oxes. They are used for things that are not audience. Okay. Anytime you need to send sound somewhere to a person, place, or thing that is not audience. That tends to be what auxes are used for. Um, if you're using an aux to send sound to something that is pointed at the audience, I would, I'm going to question you on that and, and try to understand why that's the best way to do it, OK? For reasons that, will, that I will explain in just a moment, OK? OK. Ready to move on? The next knob is this yellow knob, and it's called the pan knob. Um, and you know, you probably get what that's about. Um, so when I hit, when I route this signal to my, what's called my mix outputs, it's a, I've got a left right thing going on here, two channels. And you know, that doesn't work a whole lot in theater. We tend to not do a lot of stereo, but we're doing it right now. That maybe, that maybe we're mixing something or something for a recording or whatever. So if I route it to these main outs, if this knob is pointed straight up, it's going to route the sound equally to both outputs. Okay? But I could say only put it out of this side by turning this all the way to the right. Or only put it out of that side by turning it all the way to the right. Or I could say maybe slightly favor this side, but I just do want a little bit over there, right? So it's, it's an effort for you to manipulate stereo image, right? Of where you want this to show up in a stereo field. 
Um, again, in theater, this is not super useful, but um, but in film, very useful. In audiobooks, very useful. In uh, you know, <laughs> podcasts, very useful. Uh, music recording, very useful. All these, you know, there's a lot of really good reasons why this is useful. Not super useful for live shows, okay? Um, because stereo just doesn't work very well in large rooms, and so you kind of are going to waste a whole lot of time and energy on that um, for a live show and really not get very much out of it. Um, but that's kind of what that does. Now we get to Seth's question. So there is this button that is called mute. And what does that do? Well, first I want to talk about um, I want to define some words, okay? Um, and these are the definition of these words according to Jason Romney. And other people will have different definitions of these words. But for purposes of us being able to talk about things in a class that I'm teaching, <laughs> I want you to understand what I mean when I say certain words. Um, the word mute, according to me, should mean the same thing as dropping the fader down all the way down. That's the, that's the functionality you should get with a mute button. Okay? Um, which means what would happen to your pre fade offices if you hit a True mute button. They keep going. Nothing would happen, right? They would be unaffected, right? The other thing is called a, a it could be called an on off button or a channel enable button. Okay? And what those buttons do is they shut down the entire channel strip or turn back on the entire channel strip. That is called an on off button or sometimes also called a channel enable button. Okay. Now, if it's an on-off button, it shuts down the whole channel strip, which means what would happen to your prepaid boxes? They, also go, they would go out as well, right? Because it shuts down the whole channel strip. Um, there is not consistency across manufacturers about what those words mean, and there is not consistency across the manufacturers who make mixing consoles on which kind of button they want to put in it, regardless of what they call it. There is not consistency on what that function ought to be. Um, some, the really good consoles will give you both. They will give you two buttons, one that is a true mute and one that is a channel enabler. Um, there are very few that do that, but those ones tend to be my favorite. <laughs> I was going to say, who, like, I don't think I've seen a console that does that. Dimitri does that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Kadak does that. But Cadex is, no one's using Cadex anymore. Um, yeah. Um, that's the only way. <laughs> um, so uh, let's find out what, they, what these ones are. They say mute. But what are they actually? Well, the surest way to find out is to um, put it into a prepaid aux. Okay, pre-fade aux, I know that because the fader's down. Okay, fader is down and it's going through an aux. Let's see what happens when I push the mute button. Check, 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 check. check. Okay, this is an on-off button. Okay. <laughs> Despite the fact that it says mute. <laughs> okay. Um, great. So you just have to know that when this console says mute, it means on-off <laughs> or channel enable. Or disable. Okay. Um, the reason the the reason that the other functionality is helpful is because um, particularly for studio mixing, uh, that true mute button is really useful because you could be using auxes to feed monitors and stuff, right, during a recording. 
but you're sitting in a control room and you are trying to focus on a certain subset of the mix for a moment while they're playing. And you want to not hear all this other stuff, but you don't necessarily want to um, take out whatever mix you've already created. <laughs> and so it'd be really useful to be able to hit a mute button that stops you from hearing it without requiring you to dump all those faders that you just spent a lot of time getting in just the right place. Um, so that you can put those buttons and then you stop hearing it, but the recording thing still hears it, the monitor, the headphones still hear it, everything still hears it, you just stop hearing it for a moment and you don't have to obliterate the mix you've just done, okay? That's an example of where a true mute really, really comes in handy. The other thing I found that a true mute can, that where I use true mutes very often is uh, sometimes, you're always, I always want, when I'm doing a musical, I always want um, backstage uh, to have an A2 have the ability to listen to the mics. Because um, I always tell the A2s, like, your job is to make sure that no one ever walks out of the stage with a mic that's not working. Um, because the person who's mixing in front of house, they can't do anything about it if the mic is not working, okay? Uh, they can't do anything about that. So uh, I want the A2 to be able to, like, just head that off. If someone's battery's dead or got unplugged or the frequency went bad or something like that, I want the A2 to be able to deal with that. And one of the best ways they can deal with that is to just kind of like be able to sit and listen to the mics, kind of pre-fade in a set of headphones. I'd be like, okay, does this sound right? Are we getting a signal when they're gossiping backstage and everything? Um, okay, great, they're good. Or, oh, they're not. So, great, I gotta go find them and figure out what's going on. Um, well, some consoles don't give you uh, a really great interface for that, uh, for that kind of functionality. Because some, hopefully you have a console that has more than one PFL output. And PFL is, we'll talk about more PFL in a minute, PFL is what lets you listen to something in headphones, okay? Um, really good consoles will give you more than one PFL, meaning you can, there's, there's an option where you can listen in headphones in these headphones, or you can listen in these headphones, and those aren't necessarily connected, okay? That's, a good console will give you multiple PFLs. But, not, very few consoles actually will do that. And so one of the workarounds that I've found to doing this is that I can use a pre-fade aux for the A2. And if it's a digital console that I can give them a little remote interface into, I can just give them that row of aux knobs and say, okay, in order to hear this person, just like turn up this knob and you'll hear that person. Um, and then when I do my automation, uh, I use the mute buttons, true mute buttons, to take them out of the scene instead of killing the channel. Um, so if I have true mute buttons, I can do that without having to mess around with faders because I can use the VCAs to do with faders. We'll talk about VCAs later. But, um, so if I have true mute buttons, then I can there's a work, I could use that as a workaround to deliver myself an A2 listening station. If I don't have true mute buttons, then I have to pop the faders up and down every time that person goes into a scene. And I don't really want to do that. Um, so anyway, there's an example of how true mute can, can, become, can be used as a workaround for a console that wasn't designed to do the thing you really wanted it to do, right? Uh, but this button is, despite being called mute, it is not mute. It is channel enabled <laughs> or disabled. Uh, any questions about that? No? Okay. All right. Next button is called mix or sub. These are called groups. Uh, According to me, uh, this is another one of these words that we just have to agree what things mean, okay? So I'm going to call these groups. Groups are kind of like oxes in the sense that it is a way for you to take, another way for you to take the sound that is on this channel and send it somewhere. 
just like you can do with an ox. But the difference is with a group, it is always post fade and it's an all or nothing thing. So you don't get to decide, I only want a little bit of this to go into, the, into that group. I, it's either, it's in or it's out, because you're gonna hit a button. It's gonna go there or it's not gonna go there. And that's the group button. That's the group routing, okay? So I've got a group called mix and I've got a group called sub. Now the reason we call them groups is because uh, in the original kind of iteration of this, and this console does implement this to some extent, the idea was, well, if you've got a whole lot of inputs, you don't really want to be, you've got only really eight fingers that are useful. The thumbs are not super useful for mixing. So you really only have eight fingers, most people have eight fingers that they can mix with, okay? Um, and if you have more than eight faders, um, maybe that's gonna be hard for you. Um, but in reality, maybe like five of these mics are all pointed at more or less the same thing. Like maybe five of those faders are all drums, okay? And so maybe you don't really need to be pushing five faders up and down and want to change the drum mix. So you could route all five of those into a group and that now becomes a new fader that is just a mix of all of those drum things. And you can push that up and down as one thing. And then that goes out to your system as one thing, right? That's what the group is for. That's why they call it a group, is you're grouping sounds together to make it easier to mix them, okay? It's like with lights and the mixing system. Yeah, it's kind of like a submaster in mm -hmm. lights, right? Uh, now, uh, if, if it is to further define the word, a subgroup is the thing I just described. A subgroup is the thing where you collect some sound from multiple input channels and stick it onto a group, and that group is then routed to the main system. Did I lose? Still recording, at least? Okay, hello? Yes, still recording. Oh, the screen was <laughs> Okay, well, we'll wait for the as well. Um, so a subgroup is where you take those inputs, you put them into the group, and then that group gets routed out to your main system. Okay, that's a subgroup. A group group, or a true group, would have its own output. Okay, so meaning if I put a bunch of channels into a certain group, and this is my group, and I have now a new fader that controls all those things, I, this, this fader is connected to a physical output on the console that I send to somewhere else that is not whatever I'm considering my main system. Maybe that's an effects speaker somewhere or, you know, the dog bark speaker on stage or, you know, whatever, some sort of practical or some surrounds behind me or something. But they're pointed at the audience. The audience is hearing it. And so, I can put that sound into a group and then use the group fader to control the, the output for that, that, for that loudspeaker or set of loudspeakers, and so this group would have a physical output. So groups have their own outputs, subgroups do not. Subgroups just route to the main output. Okay, let me demonstrate. So I'm gonna first demonstrate subgroup. Okay, so here are my three drums, okay? And right now, I've got them routed to mix. And mix is the group that controls these, okay? It's the yellows, right? Some call, otherwise called main sometimes. Okay, well I'm gonna say, all right, I'm gonna get rid of those. I'm gonna instead put them into the sub group, okay? And so then I can get my mix of that. And then here is my subgroup. And I'm gonna route the subgroup to mix. So I've got a button here for mix on the subgroup. Oh. Right? So, so I'm gonna like do a little less cymbals there, a little more kick drum. I get a good mix of the drums. Now I leave it around. Now to adjust drums in the mix, I just use this. And then everything else is Okay, so I can say, I want drums, or I don't want drums. 
Alright. Subgroup. Now, I could further uh, I could further help this situation. Like maybe I want I've got these two guitars. Maybe I would like those on a subgroup as well. Well, uh, I do actually have two subgroups here. I've got two separate faders. So I could use my pan knobs to pan all the drums over to the left. And now this is my drums. And now I've freed this one up for something else. So, so I can take my two guitars, pan them over to the right, take them out of mix, put them into sub. Now, all I really have to worry about is the piano and the bass here. And then I mix drums and guitars together with the subgroups. Right? Subgroups. So, by panning the drums, are they now only coming out over here? Or are they. Uh, nope. Well, I don't know, are they? Let's see. Oh, they are. Here's good news. There is another button here called mono. Now they should be coming out of both. Right? So I can say, hey, I'm using these as separate things. I'm using these as separate subgroups, but I want them to both go to both mains. So I can click that mono button, and now these uh, routes both. Right? That makes sense. That's cool. Okay. Other questions about subgroups? Um, subgroups. There you go. Now you know subgroups. So as Maybe. long as mix is um, down, then that's like being able to mess with its channel. Yeah. So if I if I push the mix button, uh, the mix is basically a group group. Okay. That has okay. you know dedicated outputs, and I'm using it as that. Gotcha. So if I put something in mix, it just goes straight over to here, mm -hmm. and then goes out to the system. Okay. Whereas in the current way I've programmed this, if I take it out of the mix, then it doesn't go to here, and I put it in, and I click sub instead, then it goes to these. Okay. And I've told these to go to the mix group, right? So, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I can make it go not mono, and then, you know, you got the guitars over there, drums over there, because how I've done it. But if you hit mono, it puts them both in both, okay. right? So, it's like instead of sending these straight to here, I'm sending them here first. And then from here, I'm sending them to there. Gotcha. Okay? okay? And you just do that based on which of these buttons you push. Now, yes? I assume both buttons can't be pushed at the same time. No, they can. Oh, they can? Absolutely. Can I just double your output? Yeah. Right. So, I'm doubling the drums now. So yeah, they can go, they can go, you can, that's the cool thing about groups is you can have any combination of them you want. Um, so uh, big consoles will have lots of groups, you know, eight of them, 16 of them, maybe more, you know, and each of those groups could be function as subgroups to create these little submixes of things. Um, so you could have like a, a subgroup of drums, a subgroup of guitars, a subgroup of all your vocals, a subgroup of all your keyboards, a subgroup of, you know, whatever, and then, and then you're just mixing the subgroups. Right? Uh, you never touch the input faders unless you get a level set. Uh, that's a very common way of mixing live music. Uh, a lot of people mix live music that way because it's just easier uh, than having to keep track of all those faders, right? Um, but you could also have a multiple loudspeaker system that is pointed at the audience and you want the sounds of these channels to go to all of those loudspeakers, and you have processors somewhere downstream of that that's sorting out the balance for you, right? And so uh, you could use group groups for that, and that way you're at least organizing them into groups, and maybe there's processing on the console that you could apply to each of those outputs for each of those places in your system, and that would be where you use actual group outputs, and you could have each input routed to multiple groups, right? So you could have a group that was like your front fills, a group that was your center cluster, a group that was your delay fills, right? And you would want the vocals to come out of all of those, right? And so if group one is your front fills, group two is your center cluster, delay, group three is your delay fills, well, you want the vocals to come out of all those. So you go, 
you know, one, two, three on every input. And then on those groups, you do the processing. Oh, I need to EQ the front fills differently than I EQ the center cluster. Or I need to add delay to the delay fill so they don't echo. And I can do that on the group, right? Uh, and then you push the fader up and down, and it goes up and down in the whole system, and the groups are sorting out the balance of the process. Goes. Right? Another example of using groups would be like playback. So you've got QLab playback, and you would have each output in QLab would represent a different loudspeaker location in your system, right? And, but that ultimately comes into inputs on your mixing console. Okay, and so you would have group one would be the practical on the stage, group two would be your center cluster, group three would be like your side surround, group four would be your other side surround, group five would be the one behind, group six would be your subwoofer, right? And in QLab, you're just, that's all, you're gonna label the outputs of QLab and that's all you're gonna worry about. But in the console, you're gonna say, all right, well, input one is coming out of output one of QLab and we're assuming that's the practical on stage. So I'm gonna route this one to group one and group one goes out to the front, or goes, goes to the thing on stage. And then group two is the center cluster channel from QLab, so, and the center cluster is fed from group two on the console, so that one is gonna get routed to group two, fader up, you go. And that way, um, you know, your uh, operator, person mixing the show, you know, when, this, when the show, when, when you fill the audience with people and the show, whole show needs to be 60 dB louder, they can just manipulate these faders to take the whole thing up or down, um, and the routing is still happening, right? Um, and they don't have, you know, what I really makes me very frustrated is when I see people do their QLab routing through auxes. And then, you know, when, it's, when you have that kind of problem, you're like, you're like hunting around on these million knobs to try to like make a simple adjustment that should be just... There's a reason the fader is the closest thing to you. <laughs> because it is the thing that is supposed to be the easiest to operate and the thing you should be touching the most. Um, and the thing that is the farthest away from you is the thing that is the most complicated and the thing you should be touching the least, which is the game knob, <laughs> right? And we learned how complicated that was last time. It took us 45 minutes just to understand that. Um, so you're gonna set that once and you're never gonna touch it again. And it's the farthest thing away from you for that reason. Um, and because a big mistake I see a lot of people make is they say, well, you know, it's not right until all the faders are up here at the same spot. That's a mix, right? And I'm not comfortable unless that's happening. And therefore to make everything right, I gotta go up here and adjust my gains in order for this to all level out. And you see people spending all night mixing up here. <laughs> well, what's that doing to their to their mix and their their system? It's, it's well, introducing the, noise. it's introducing noise. It's potentially introducing clipping. Um, <laughs> it's this is not a particularly artistic control. Um, you know, you move it a teeny tiny bit and you get a big change. Um, so this is a really not effective way to mix a show. If these faders were only ever supposed to stay in one spot, it would be a button, okay? It is the largest controller on this console because it's the thing that's supposed to be moving all over the place throughout the show. There's never one place where it sits. You're gonna be moving it all the time, okay? There's no right or wrong place to put this. The right place to put it is wherever it sounds good right this second. And if it sound, if, if put, putting it up here sounds better 30 seconds from now, then fine, that's the new right place. And putting it all the way down here sounds better five minutes from now, great, that's the new right place for that moment. This is what you should be doing all night, <laughs> okay? Now, where some people get really confused is now let, let me let me demonstrate this problem. Uh, Subgroup. Sub so here I am, 
and I'm mixing my show, and maybe, actually, let me emphasize the point. Maybe I'm like, okay, that's too loud. Like, I, I, I only have to take better than high, I'm too loud. Uh, that's not fun to mix that. And so, you know, like, I need to turn my gain down. I'm coming in too hot. No! <laughs> Do not turn your gain down because your fader is too low and you're getting too much sound. If, you, if your fader is up here and you already have more sound than you need, you spent too much of someone's money <laughs> on too big of a sound system, okay? Um, you did something wrong, okay? You got a little too hot to trot and you wanted the big, cool thing and you convinced someone to spend a bunch of money on some really expensive, early loud stuff. And you shouldn't have done that. You've got a sound system designed for a room of 3,000 people, and there's 10 people in the room. Okay? That's the problem. It is not a gain problem. Okay? You start messing with that gain and then crank up that fader, you're gonna you're gonna have noise, best case scenario, clipping, worst case scenario. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of Problem being caused yourself to mess around with this once you've got a nice spot. So if you're doing, if you're in this situation and you're like, "Whoa, I've got too much system," well, take these down, <laughs> right? Just take those down, um, or go to the amps and turn the amps down, right? And make a note saying, "Next time, I won't spend so much of someone else's money on a sound system that." didn't need to be in this room, okay? Um, so there is no right place about this fader. These faders have uh, a superpower, just like the, the um, preamplifiers have a superpower where they can amplify the signal without amplifying noise. The faders uh, have very low self noise. They are actually not amplifiers, they are attenuators. So the faders turn things down. Um, and they have very low self noise, which means you can bring some, you can bring a signal down very low, uh, and you will not dramatically alter your signal noise ratio because the fader itself has very low self noise, which means it's not it, you know even though the signal is going to be low going through the fader, there's very little noise on this, and therefore you won't your your signal still won't be close to the noise floor. Okay, that's the superpower of a fader. Okay. And you spend a lot of money on these because good faders are very quiet. <laughs> and they're also hopefully smooth to operate and everything, but really you want faders that are very quiet from a noise point of view so that you can bring it all the way down to here and not have to worry about your signal to noise ratio being all out of whack. Okay? Um, hopefully, you get what are called 100 millimeter faders, which is what these are. Because um, then you have more options for moving them around. Sometimes you'll get 80 millimeter faders, which are shorter. And those aren't as fun to mix up, but they're cheaper. So if you're trying to save money, that's the way. Um, but the important thing to understand about the fader is it turns things down. It doesn't amplify, generally speaking. Uh, when the fader is up, the re there's a reason zero is at the top and it's labeled in minus 5, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus infinity. Minus infinity means like we are literally subtracting forever until there is no sound. So all the way up is zero, meaning the fader is not turning it down. Now, most faders give you a little 10 dB nudge <laughs> at the end. They do give a little bit of an amplification. Um, but it's not much, right? To get it hotter, you need to get it hotter at the preamp, okay? So the fader will give you a little bit of boost, and, but if you've done your gain structure right, then going past zero should cause you a problem. Going past zero should cause you a clip, okay? So don't go past zero, unless you've done your gain structure wrong, okay? Uh, my rule of thumb is if, there, if it's a live mic and there is sound coming through it and that fader is up, 
your finger is on that fader. <laughs> you should never have a live mic with sound going through it. Uh, that your fader, your finger is not on that fader, or is not on a fader that controls that fader, or is not, you know, like you really want to avoid that because there's a lot of ways that that could get away from you really quick. Um, and hopefully you're being artistic and you're responding to what you're hearing, right? And you're, you're doing this all night. Can't do that if your finger's not on the fader. The fader has this little dip in it that is designed to cradle your fingertip so that you can do it like this. It is not designed to be pinched. I see so many people mix like this. It's like, why are you doing it like that? Like you can only do two faders at a time like this. <laughs> this is this is this is the way. <laughs> okay, this is the way. It's designed to cradle your fingers in, so you can have all eight fingers going at one time. And you're thinking, well, that's really hard to keep track of all eight fingers. Piano players do it every day. If they can do it, you can do it. Okay. What's that? And they use the thumbs too, right? <laughs> but thumbs are hard to mix with. I mean, but eight fingers are good. Okay. Questions so far? All right. The next button. What's that? Oh yes. There's always uh, the next button is PFL. PFL stands for pre-fade listen. Now there's, a, there's, there's some more words that we need to define, okay? Uh, PFL, pre-fade listen. AFL, after-fade listen. Solo. Sometimes you might see Q, <laughs> as in C U E. Okay. 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 Although I haven't seen that one very often. Everyone stop. Okay. Those things, solo, PFL, AFL, are often used interchangeably, sometimes to describe the same thing, although they are not the same. Okay, I'm going to tell you what they actually do and what each of those words actually mean and what functionality you should expect out of a control that has each of those labels on it. Whether it actually does that, I don't know, but let's tell you what they mean. PFL, pre-fade listen. When you push PFL, what that is supposed to do is it allows you, well, it takes the sound pre-fader, so it, it, it ignores the fader and it takes all the sound on that channel and it puts it somewhere that you can listen to it. And usually that somewhere is this headphone jack. But it could also be an output on the console like for some studio monitors or something, right? So it could be a, it could be a physical output that you could feed to speak to speakers, but most of the time that's gonna be headphones. <laughs> Okay, so you can go. Anybody got headphones with them that you want to plug in here and try it? Yeah, I have my headphones, but not recording. Oh, I can go. Let me try. I've got mine. Oh, you got yours? Let's see if it works. As long as I put these down. Uh, if you didn't, I'll go get some. I forgot to grab that this morning. All right. Let's see. Yep, stick it in there. Headphones. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> it works. <laughs> okay. Now this console has a volume control for the headphone output. Mm. Okay, so you can adjust how loud the headphones are overall. Which is helpful because I think I blasted the fire first up in the So, uh, yeah. 
No, not at all. <laughs> uh, so that's what PFL does, pre-fade listen. You hit that button, it takes all the sound, ignores the fader, and shoots it out of an output that hopefully only you can hear. Okay? Or if not only you, someone else that is not the audience. Okay? <laughs> but certainly don't want the audience to hear that. Because uh, it would be suddenly very loud, uh, most likely. That's PFL. AFL stands for after fade listen. Same thing as PFL, except it includes the fader in the calculation. So if the fader is being used to attenuate the signal on the channel at all, then that attenuation will be accounted for in the signal that gets sent to the headphones. Generally speaking, you tend to see AFLs on outputs. So for example, um, this is the, the, all my auxes have AFL buttons on them. My aux uh, volume controls, my main aux volume controls. So if I send my drums, oops, let me, I moved it, didn't I? Let me just move it back, then it'll make more sense. Move that back to one. Oh. Okay, move that back to one. Okay, so I just got my drums going in prepaid. Now, I can hit this AFL button, they should show up now in the headphones. Yes. Okay. But if I turn this down, it's also not in the headphones. Okay? Because it's an AFL, after fade listen. So if I fade this all the way down, even though I've got the AFL button on, I don't hear it in the headphones. Why is that? Why do you think they did it that way on the aux? Why wouldn't they do it as PFL? Think as his headphones? Well, think about the things you use pre-fade auxes for. I mean, you can see what they're listening to the monitor. Okay, so you're using an aux for a monitor, right? And the you know the drummer's like, man, what's the it sounds weird in the monitor. Like I can't hear it. I've lost it. It's gone. You know. Um, and you're like, I don't know. I mean, I'm rounding things to it. I don't know. Well, let me let me listen. So if you hit the button and you put it in your headphones and you don't hear anything either. It's like, oh, something's up. Okay. Right. Or if you hit the AFL and you hear stuff. You shouldn't be hearing the exact same thing that the drummer is hearing in the monitor. You should not be hearing a pre version. You should be hearing the exact same thing. So you're like, oh, I'm hearing exactly what you're hearing now. Yes, okay, we need more snare drum in that. I understand, yes. Okay, great. Okay. So that's where AML becomes very useful. Um, Sometimes on some mixing consoles, you get to select whether it behaves like a PFL or an AFL. And they will show you that, and it'll, the label will change, or it'll have a different label or something, or there'll be a global button that says these will be AFLs or these will be PFLs. Uh, there's another term called solo. Some consoles will label their PFL buttons as solo even though it behaves like a PFL. The term solo is another one of those recording studio things. Okay, in fact, solo, you'll see that in Logic, you'll see that in Pro Tools, because those are designed for that kind of environment. And what solo does is it's a quick shortcut to just say, I want to hear this only for just a moment. And it mutes everything else and lets you just hear that channel. So it's easier to just hit that once and hear only that thing than it is to, to go and hit 37 mute buttons, okay? Or kill 37 faders. <laughs> it's easier to just say it's solo. And then I can hear just that for a second, uh, which is super useful in an in, in, in editing and recording environment to be able to just say, I just need to listen to this for a second and mute everything else automatically. That's what solo is supposed to do. Um, but 
some consoles will call that button solo when it's actually a PFL. When you push that button, it doesn't mute any channels. It just does a PFL. It just takes that signal pre-fade and sets it out to your headphones, even though they call it a solo. Mackie does this. Mackie calls their PFL buttons solo buttons. It's the most annoying thing. <laughs> it's not a solo. <laughs> it's a PFL. Stop it. You are making all of our lives more difficult. Okay? So uh, watch out for that. That's a little heads up. Sometimes solo is used to describe PFL. So if we were working on a, a console that had solo as a PFL, like, yeah. would we need to, I guess, mess with other things to... You just need to know that that's what it means. Okay. <laughs> so that you don't push it thinking that something different is going to happen than what is actually going to happen. Uh, so anytime you see like a button that says PFL, AFL, or solo, take a second before you do the show <laughs> to push that button it's and understand what it actually does. Because the label next to it may not actually accurately describe what it does. In the same way that if you see the word mute, on a button there. That may or may not act accurately describe what that button does. So before you try to do the show, take a minute and make sure you understand what it does. Does it shut down the oxes or does it not shut down the oxes? Okay. Uh, and you can find out really quick, which is by clicking the button and seeing what happens. Or you can look it up in the manual and they'll usually tell you. They'll say, oh, it actually does this. Okay. Questions? Other questions? Yeah. Are these? These are the oxes. Yes. Other questions? On the Yamaha boards, it says uh, Q, and I think based on that, that's like mostly a PFL. Q is in Yamaha world. Q is PFL. Mm -hmm. Q is um, back from the it, Q is something that's back from the days of reel-to-reel -reel tape decks. Okay, and. To, to set up the reel-to-reel take deck, you had to cue it. And you cued it by, by routing that into your headphones so that you could move the heads on the tape reels to line up the tape at just the right spot on the head so that when you hit the play button, it would start in exactly the right spot. Okay? So, so in certain contexts, um, like recording studios or in theater, we used to do this. When I first started as a sound designer, my first few shows I designed as a sound designer, I did it on real drill tape decks. And you would have all your sound cues on these, these reels, you know, two or three decks. And you know you would play a cue, you'd stop it, and then while you're waiting for the next stage manager to give you an next cue, you, you, you hit the little cue button, and you go, okay, the dog bark's ready to go, great. And then when you hit button, you get dog bark. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so, that's what Q meant. And so Q could mean solo. It could mean PFL. Could mean AFL. Uh, in Yamaha world, it tends to behave like PFL most of the time. Why do they use Q? I don't know. They also use on off buttons instead of mutes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. But it actually does on off though. Yeah. Right? So their button says on off and it actually does on off. It actually kills the whole channel strip, right? Uh, so they got that one right. <laughs> but then they use Q to describe PFL for some unknown reason, which I don't understand. I don't know if it's like a Japanese translation thing or because the, they're a Japanese company. Is that what's going on? Uh, is this a lost in translation thing? I'm not sure, but it's very bizarre. So yes, watch out for Q. <laughs> Probably means pay a thumb. Or maybe it doesn't. But you can find out by playing with it. Seeing what it All right, other questions? All right, Cal, I'm going to answer your question about the INS input. OK? So you remember last time, we were looking at the back of the console here, and we saw there was an extra quarter inch 
connection on each of our input channels, and it's labeled INS. And Hal said, oh, is that for like instruments, like a, like a guitar or something? I said, no, it's not. Oh, that doesn't mean instrument. I said, no. Um, and Cal's whole worldview like, got recalibrated <laughs> in that moment, right? And I said, I will clarify next time. I'm now going to clarify. Um, what that stands for is insert. Insert. And let me demonstrate how exactly that works. So, mixing consoles are kind of expensive. And especially in the analog days, the more channels you added, the more auxes you added, the more EQ knobs you added, the more expensive the console got. And you kind of have to do it, if you do it once, you have to do it everywhere. It just doesn't make sense to have some channels be able to do all the things and some channels not. No one wants that console. But you do it once, you times it by however many channels you're building into the console. And maybe you only really need it once or twice for any particular project. But to get it built into the console, you have to have it on every channel. And that suddenly the price of the thing goes through the roof. Okay, so the way the answer to this this problem was the manufacturers came up with this idea of insert. And so I tell you what, we will build in what we whatever we decide the core functionality is for the price point we're trying to deliver this thing for, and then we will give you this this connector that will allow you to expand the functionality of the mixing console with a specific tool that you would add. Okay. For example, maybe you're like, this EQ is nowhere near sufficient. I need much more control than that. Well, you could go and get yourself a better EQ, a 10 band EQ or something, okay? And you could connect it into that insert connection and that is akin to cutting open the console and sticking that EQ in the channel strip. Okay, and now you've got a bigger EQ on that channel. Okay, or maybe you want a gate on this channel, and a gate is like an automatic mute button. So, like, only if they hit the drum do I want the mic to let sound go through, or the channel to mixer to let sound go through. That's called a gate. So. There's, I always think of it like there's a little Smurf inside the box, and the Smurf is listening to the sound of the headphones, and the Smurf has their hand on a mute button. And you tell the Smurf, okay, if you hear the drum, unmute. <laughs> and when you, when you don't hear the drum, mute. Okay? Because, like, I don't want to do that all night. <laughs> I don't want to sit there and mute on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off every time the drum gets hit. That would be a pain in the butt. So you're going to, the Smurf will do that for you. Okay? That's gay. So maybe I want that functionality, but I don't want to pay for it 30, 30 times because that's how many channels I have. I just need it on that one channel. I can use an insert for that. I can go buy myself a little gate, which is what this is, and I can insert it, and now this channel has a gate, okay? Or a compressor, and a compressor is an automatic volume knob. So compressor is like, hey, like this signal is all over the place. Sometimes it's loud, sometimes it's quiet, and I'm having a hard time keeping up with it. Because I, you know, I'm running out of like brain bandwidth to be like going up and down like constantly on this thing, you know, from a moment to this is like it's getting out of hand. I want to get a smurf to do this for me. So so there's a smurf inside that box that's also listening to the sound of headphones, but this time has their hand on a fader. And you're like, hey Smurf, just like if it gets too loud, just turn it down. And if it gets quiet again, turn it back up. You know, just sit here and do this for me. Ride this thing up and down for me so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? That's what a compressor does. Okay? And so I could buy myself a little compressor, and I could plug it into that connection, and it would insert the compressor. It would, like, pry this open and give me, great, I got a compressor now on this channel. Okay? So how does it work? Well, let me show you. Now you're thinking, wow, Jason, this sounds really cool. How does this work? Well, you get one connector called insert. And that connector is both an output and an input at the same time. It does both at the same time. 
How in the world does it do that? Well, on an inexpensive console like this, it would be a single quarter inch connector. Uh, on a more expensive console, they might give you separate connectors. They would give you an insert send and an insert return. Or like This is the connector where you send the sound out to the thing, and this is the connector where you bring the sound back in. Okay? Um, some consoles will give you two XLR connections for send and return. But that takes up space, and XLRs are expensive, and every connector you add has more money. So it is possible to do it with a single quarter inch connector. Well, how do you do it? Well, a quarter inch connector has three connections on it, right? Tip, ring, sleeve. And we learned last week that uh, for a balanced audio signal, that the tip would be the positive polarity version of the signal, the ring would be the negative polarity version of the signal, and the sleeve would be the shared common or the ground. Okay? And on an XLR, pin two is the positive polarity version of the signal, pin three is the negative polarity version, and pin one is the shared ground. Okay? Well, if you were willing to give up on balanced audio, then you could take, you could say, okay, forget about that negative polarity version, and let's use this pin for something else. So you can use the tip as the output, sound goes out on that, sharing with the ground, and you can use the ring as an input, sound comes back in on that tip, on that ring, and it shares the ground. And you could make yourself a little cable that does that, of which I have made. And it has a quarter inch and it fans out to two XLRs, but one of them is an XLR pin connector, which is typically used for output signals, and one of them is an XLR socket connector, which is typically used for inputs. Okay. Yeah, we, we for a long time we've been like assigning genders to these things, and um, we're starting to realize that that's silly. It doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> like why are, why are we assigning boy girl to this inanimate object? <laughs> like so so there's there's a pretty big movement in in the sound community right now to like be like this is silly. Why are we why are we sexualizing our our connectors? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, how about we just like use different words? So we're trying we're tr using words pins and sockets generally right now. Okay. So the pin is is the is refers to the, the pins inside that the socket is the holes. You know? So pins tend to be sound comes out, sockets sound goes in. So this is your output. This would be your send. This is your input. This would be your return. So you plug this connector in, and I'm going to put it in the channel with the microphone. And what I've done is I have now, I mean, I've effectively disabled this now. If I don't plug that in anything. So here's my mic. I have no sound. Where'd the sound go? It's sitting <laughs> on that XLR connector right now. I took it off of the bottom of the preamp, and it's now sitting there, going nowhere. And the rest of the channel strip is listening for the signal here. So all the EQ and the auxes and everything is listening off of this now, and there's nothing there. But guess what I can do? I can put something there. <laughs> so what if you connect them? Nothing will happen? Oh, if I connect them, then I'm back in business. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. The downside now is I no longer have a balanced signal. Okay. Right? So I now have exposed myself potentially to some interference. Which if I only ever go a couple of feet, then I'm probably going to be fine. But if I'm going to run this 100 feet down to the other side of the building, I probably don't want to do that unbalanced if I can help it. Okay. Um, but for an insert, it's just right here, so it's probably going to be fine. So I'm just going to plug these two cables in. Now what I've done is this cable goes to the input of this thing. And this cable comes back from the output of this processor. So I plug that in there. 
So now the, sound, the mic comes into the preamp, and I adjust the gain, and then it goes directly out into this processor. This processor does its thing, and then spits the sound back out, and I bring it back in, and it goes down through the rest of the channel on the console. Okay? So let me demonstrate. So right now I've got the box bypassed. So it's just letting the sound pass through. Okay? Uh, and we, um, it doesn't, yeah, it's, so it's not doing anything to the sound. But if I turn it on, so let me turn the gate on. Remember, the gate is the automatic mute button. Let me demonstrate. So I've got the Smurf. You can see the Smurf is kind of cutting it out a little bit. So um, I've got a threshold here. And the threshold is like how I tell the Smurf, you know, if it's any louder than this, I want to hear it. If it's quieter than this, I don't want to hear it. So I'm going to turn that down a little bit. That way it will only turn on when I talk. So if you look, I've got a green, red light, green light. So green light means I'm hearing it. Red light means it's Murphy's game. Okay? It's the most yep. really talk. So when I talk, it unmutes it. When I don't talk, it means it. So like if I talk, it opens up. Jasmine, say something. Jasmine. See? So it wouldn't let us hear Jasmine in the mic. But it only hears me because I'm louder than Mike, right? But if Jasmine says something into the mic. Jasmine. <laughs> and I say something I say something into the mic, it doesn't respond to me as well, right? Okay, so this is a really great way to help control bleed between mics that are next to each other, <laughs> right? So great, that's the gate. And then it still shows the um, the meter over there too. Yeah, we we're, we've got the compressor bypass, so we'll okay. talk about that in a second. But I've effectively put a gate into I've inserted a gate into this console on that channel. So now that channel has a gate, a gate. and I could get that without having to buy. 12 gates, <laughs> which was what I would have had to do if I wanted Soundcraft to build it into the console to begin with. They're not going to just put it on one channel. They're going to have to put it on all the channels. Now, the digital world is a little bit easier because it's just software. It's just code to add that. So it doesn't, it's not a, it's a huge expense. But it's also easy for them to like give you a little budget of processing. And you say, you can stick it around in software anywhere you want in a digital console. It doesn't really cost you any extra money. Um, but an analog world is more complicated. Okay, let's talk about the compressor now. So here's the compressor. And remember, the compressor is the automatic volume. And I just want to let the Smurf ride the fader for me a little bit. So I'm going to say, yeah, it's got a meter. And this yellow button is called the threshold. So when you see the yellow button light up, that means I have become too loud. So I tell the Smurf, hey, listen, if anything ever gets louder than that yellow, then that's too loud. Turn that down. Okay. Now I can control that using the threshold. So I can say, hey, I'm going to turn that down a little bit. Okay. So now I'm hitting the threshold more often. And then I say, you know, how much to turn it down? Maybe a lot, actually. So now when I talk, and I, I talk really quiet, nothing happens. But when I talk really loud, you see the red lights that come on? That's how much the Smurf turned it down by. Mm. Okay, so I can talk really quiet or I can talk really loud, and it sounds the same coming out of the last speaker, right? Whether I talk really loud or really quiet, because um, the Smurf is riding the data volume. Okay, that's a compressor. The compressor. Ah, okay. It compresses the dynamic range. Uh, and so I have now inserted a compressor into my console, right? And I can actually have both at the same time. So I can both gate and compress at the same time uh, with this particular processor, which is super, super handy. Okay. There you go, Cal. That's what the INS means. Insert. Super, super handy. Yeah. We even have an eight channel compressor over here in the shop, which is specifically designed to just be like, I want to put eight compressors in this console, <laughs> and it's one little like 2U rack unit. And you can just go, you get a compressor, 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 right? And it's all one thing. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's a separate table for each one, but you know, but it's super useful. How are we doing? So yes, Connor. this specific unit can have two channels, yes? That's what the other half. Right, so yeah, so I could patch in a second set of gates and compressors on another channel if I wanted to with another insert. Or I could say gate, gate, compressor, compressor. Oh. I don't have to link them. Oh. So okay. I could have four processors here. Okay. Yes? Did you end up finding that link button then? No. I thought this thing had a link button that allow, that would allow you to just daisy chain the gate into the compressor, but I, I, I must be thinking of a different piece of equipment because it doesn't have it. So what I did is I actually literally put a cable, just a little XLR patch cable from the output of the gate to the input of the compressor just to create that signal chain. So, so you can daisy chain as many compressors as you, or as many not compressors, processors. processors. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because the, the insert connector doesn't care. Right. The insert connector just sends the sound out and then it listens back for whatever you send back to it on the end. It doesn't care what happened to it in that trip. Okay. Right, you could have done a hundred things to it and it's fine. Right. Yes, yes. So the Smurf thing is yes. a compressor. Um, well, this thing is a can be a gate and it can be a compressor. Oh, there's a, uh, that's the other side. Yeah. So but what's the processor? The, a processor, I, that's a term we use to describe anything that alters the sound in some way. Oh, okay. okay? So a, a gate is a processor, oh, a compressor is a processor, gotcha. a reverb unit is a processor. So that yeah. in it's a yeah. build processor. Right. Yes. Okay. So a processor is just the thing I plug the sound into because I want to process the sound in some way. Okay. Right? Gotcha. Um, screw around with it. Uh, I'll process it. Put it through a process. Yes. Um, that process could mean a lot of things. Hmm. Other questions? So you're starting to see now, like this little dinky console that looked like, oh, I could hardly do anything on it. Hmm. Um, we can do a lot of things on this, actually. Um, especially when you start thinking about inserts. I mean, we have, we have these two subgroups now. We've got six auxes. We can toggle two of them between pre and post fade. We've got all these EQs. We've got uh, these two subgroups that can be actual groups if we want them to be. Um, and, and then you add the inserts, and we can, we can really do something here. Right? We could do a lot with this little console. We can do quite a, quite a big show. You've got to like, be smart about how you use the console. But uh, if you really understand how everything works, you can get a lot of mileage out of this thing. OK? Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, is there anything else I wanted to talk about um, output-wise? I think I've covered kind of incidentally everything on the output-wise output things. Um, this console has a couple of weird little things um, where there are some extra inputs that are called stereo returns that are over here, but that's just a special thing. There's not really a whole lot of point in teaching you about that, but you could read about that. Um, I think, oh, 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 meters. Okay, so uh, meters are the little lights that turn on to tell you that there's sound happening. There's some things you need to understand about meters, though. Uh, we already learned one thing about them last week. What did we learn about them last week? They lie to you. They lie to you quite often. Okay? Um, most often, when the red light comes on, that does not usually mean the signal has clipped yet. Okay? Sometimes it could mean the signal has clipped, but sometimes it could mean it hasn't clipped. It might just mean it's almost going to clip. Um, and this is to appease the people who want to see all the red lights turn on uh, to see how good the console is. Okay. It's great. All the red lights are on and it's no distortion. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, the manufacturers trick you. <laughs> They'll make the light turn on sooner. So, yes, the, sometimes the meters will lie to you. That's the first thing to know is they cannot be completely trusted. Uh, the second thing the meters uh, tell you is 
is, is they may not tell you enough information. So like each input on this console has a meter. And if you look at the meter, our options are signal and peak. Signal means there's something there. Peak means it has possibly clipped, or maybe not. Okay. I don't know about you. That's not an that's not a whole lot of information for me. Um, because what's the threshold for some, between something and nothing? Yeah, I mean, I don't actually know. What 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 is? How are they deciding the difference between something and nothing? Because, you know. The difference between the loudest sound that would come into this console and the quietest thing, which would be nothing, could be the, a, a range of a trillion. So where in that trillion do we cross the line between nothing and something? Um, I don't know. So just because the signal light isn't turning on doesn't necessarily mean there is no audio signal traveling on that channel. It just hasn't broken the threshold that they decided constitutes something, okay? So if you pay a little bit more money for your console, they'll ideally give you a bit more resolution than that. <laughs> a few more lights that will give you some more options. In this console, they didn't, but they're, they are doubling the PFL to give you this other function. So I hit PFL and uh, in addition to putting it into the headphones, it also routes that signal into a higher resolution meter. Okay, and that meter has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve possible steps in it. And they range from the lowest light being minus 20. So I wonder if that's threshold between something and nothing here. Like, do, does the signal light on the input channel not turn on until the signal is minus 20 dB from nominal operating level? Because if that's the case, uh, there is definitely stuff that I care about below <laughs> minus 20, right? Um, but this one says minus 20 minus 15, minus 10, minus 6, minus 3, 0. 0 means 1.23 volts or plus 4 dBU, which is kind of nominal operating level of all this equipment. And then it goes plus 3 above that, plus 6, plus 9, plus 12, plus 15, plus 18, and plus 18 is when it goes red, which hopefully means that uh, 22 dBU is what will clip this console. Hopefully that's what it means. But it could mean that actually 28 dBU is what clips, clips this console, if the, if the meter is lying to us in that way. Or it could mean that what they are calling plus 18 is actually plus 14 or plus 12, if they're trying to make the clip light turn on before it clips. Because it tends to be, you know, 3 or 6 dB, you know, where they make the, the clip light turn on 3 or 6 dB before the clip actually registers. So it very well could be that that meter is lying to us as well. And it's definitely lying to us about the clip. But is it lying to us about that minus 20? I don't know. Um, it very well could be. Uh, but this is much more useful because I, I see much more information besides just do I have something or do I have nothing. Um, but what is something and what is nothing? I don't know. It just depends, and you got to look that up. So you so don't trust this too much. This is what's called a peak program meter, which means it's sh it is very fast, and it's trying to always show you the peak value, the maximum value at any given point in time that the signal is represented. There are other meters that could be called VU meters, and the VU meters are slightly lazy. And they kind of show you an average. They're doing kind of a running average, right? This is kind of 
ish. This is generally where your signal is sitting, right? You know, it's not going to respond to really fast clips or peaks or anything. Um, it's just going to kind of like generally, it's going to wiggle around in the area where the sound is averaging. That can be useful for some things, but it's not super useful from a gain structure point of view because I need to know when it clips <laughs> to get this right. Um, so a BU meter is not going to be helpful for that, but it can be helpful if you're just understanding like how's my signal to noise ratio going? Am I generally running this, the signal through the console hot enough to feel like I've got a good signal to noise ratio? And the BU meter can help you with that. It's like, yeah, generally you're up here. Great. Awesome. Good. There are times when I'm less than that, there are times when I'm more than that, but generally I'm running here. That's, that's helpful in some contexts. This console doesn't have BU meters. Uh, so you don't get that, but uh, some do. But this is super disappointing. <laughs> this one little green light that is either on or off. Like, I really, that's, I guess, better than nothing. But would it have been that much more expensive to just even give me, like, two more or something, you know? <laughs> uh, I just feel like that shouldn't have broke the bank. They've got those. They've got the real estate here to do it. Um, I think that's worth paying a little bit more money for, in my opinion. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Looking at the back here, the, um, there's one more quarter inch connection for direct out. Is oh yes, that? good. So. How yeah, what good, excellent question. I forgot to talk about that. So yes, there is another quarter inch output that says direct out or DIR. Um, what that does is the sound comes in this channel and then regardless of what you've done with the auxes or groups, it just takes the sound after, you know, you, the direct out can be either pre-fade or post-fade. If the direct out is pre-fade, then it comes straight in, goes through the preamp, and then goes right back out that connector. It doesn't even do the EQ. Thing. It depends. Oh. So some consoles, some consoles will, you know, when you say when it's a pre-fade direct out, that'll be post EQ. Some consoles it'll be pre EQ. Some consoles let you choose. Um, this this one has a button next to the direct out that says pre or post. Now whether it's pre EQ or not, I don't know. Um, but it'll come straight in through the preamp and then go right back out. But it doesn't bypass the rest of the signal chain. So it, it just taps it, goes right back out, and then also keeps going through here. Okay. If it's post fade, it goes all the way through here and is responsive to what you do on the fader. What's this useful for? Uh, well, I can tell you a couple of things that I've used it for. I've used it for recordings. So uh, if you're ever going to do like a recording of a live show uh, and you want to maintain the independent signals, you know, because the mix you create for the, the house doesn't necessarily sound good in a recording. And so you can keep all those signals separate and just like you've got an independent thing, you just go direct out into some multi-track recorder and then you start out a, a, a recording mix later, right? Um, that's one use for it, it's for the recording track. Another use could be um, like maybe QLAT playback. Maybe this is just a playback show and you don't have any live mics or anything. It's just playback, but you really just need the console um, to sort out, help you with some gain structure issues and to maybe give you a mass, you know, an overall volume control to uh, turn the whole show up or down but you're not mixing anything in here, right? Uh, well, the direct out could be post fade and that way you don't have to worry about groups or anything. It just, if this is the QLab channel that represents the center cluster, great, it goes through here and goes direct out to the amp for the center cluster. This is the channel for the front fills, great. It goes straight in here, it goes right back out to the front fill amp. And you don't have to mix it. You don't have to like go over here. Uh, but it gives you some gain. It gives you a polarity inversion if you need it. It gives you a fader in case you need to like make a, a level adjustment on the fly during the show. Um, I've used it for that before. 
Yeah? Direct taps are cool. They can be very useful in some situations. I don't know. Have you used them for anything else, Matthew? For um, direct outs? For other than multi track recordings? Yeah. Um, you can use them if you need a separate monitor console. Oh, yeah. Right. Good. Yes. So oh. yep. if you are using a mixing console for front of house and then another mixing console for um, yeah, for mixing monitors, right? So you can have two separate people working on that. You can send all of your inputs to one console and then direct out into that other console. So now you both get a copy of it, yeah. um, which we did on the show at the beginning of the summer. Oh, yeah. Like so. Yeah, that's good. I, I forgot about that. That's a, that is a definite use. <laughs> I definitely use direct outs that way. Um, there's another way to do that. You can do what's called an ISO split, which is like a little, uh, it's a little box that has a transformer in it and, and you put the sound in and it creates an isolated, transformer isolated pair of outputs. And one can go to the main console, one can go to the other console. And it isolates things like the phantom power. Uh, it, and it, 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 you don't have to worry about things like ground loops um, since those two things might be plugged into two different power locations. Um, that's another way of doing that. But yes, and it also can potentially help because if you do it, like let's say all the mics are probably on stage and the console is in front of house, well, you're gonna have to run all those cables all the way to the house and then all the way back again um, to backstage to get that monitor console. Whereas if you do an ISO split, all the mics go into the box on stage and then just go straight into the monitor console and then you're only running one bundle of enormous cables down front of house. That's another way of doing the, the monitor mix. But yes, direct house is, a, a classic way of, use, of creating a monitor console. Uh, okay. Other questions? Things that I haven't talked about that about that you want to know about that maybe you've heard about or tried to do and don't understand. No. You want to talk about the homework? Yeah. Another use for. It. 